you really want to know, then come on, let's go. Take a stroll down those... What's going on, everybody? Welcome into another edition of the Country Roads webcast, brought to you by Trio 4 Productions. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Cruz. Today, we're bringing you an edition that normally would be our recap show, but uh, as we all probably know by now, there was no West Virginia game this past weekend. It was canceled due to the Hurricane Florence coming in there in the Carolinas. So, WG vs. NC State did not take place, but we still got a good show coming for you today as we'll talk about the cancellation of that game as well as uh, this season for West Virginia and what's happened so far and kind of discuss what we think going forward. I'll be joined again by a good friend of ours at the Country Roads webcast and Mountaineer season ticket holder, Stephen Vestal. But before we get into all that, let's talk about where West Virginia sits in the polls this week. Um, in the top 25 polls, they moved up two spots in both of those. Um, the coaches poll, they went from 15th up to 13th, and the AP poll there went from 14th up to 12th in the country now. So approaching the top 10 in both of those polls, and hopefully uh, West Virginia can keep winning in a couple more games. They can get into that top 10 as t uh, games are going to get tougher from here on out as conference play starts uh, starting this coming up week against Kansas State. West Virginia is getting into the meat of that schedule now and into the Big 12 play. With that being said, though, I'm going to take a minute and get uh, Steven on the line here, and we're going to come back and talk about the cancellation of this uh, WVU versus NC State game for the, from this past weekend as well as discussing the West Virginia season thus far and what we think and uh, what we think about it going forward. So uh, stay tuned to the Country Roads webcast. All right, back here on the Country Roads webcast, joined again by our good friend Stephen Vestal. I'm going to talk a little bit about this season thus far and the cancellation of this WUNC State game and what we think going forward. Uh, good to have you back on, Stephen. How you doing, man? I'm going pretty good, man. Thanks for having me back. Uh, no problem, no problem. So, uh, no further delay, let's get into it. Uh, WVU-NC State was canceled. Um, let's talk about how, how it might affect West Virginia going forward. Uh, do you think that you know the cancellation of this game, if West Virginia is there at the end of the season, could hurt their college football playoff chances? Um, I think if West Virginia is down to a spot to where they have one loss, uh, even just one loss, they, it would, it's probably going to come back to bite them. Um, as of right now, I don't think the, the voters and the polls have held it against them too much. So, Unless West Virginia goes defeated and runs the table in the Big 12, I think it's going to hurt them pretty bad. Yeah, I, I think it could. It's, it's like, like you said, this hasn't hurt them yet in the polls. You know, they're sitting in the 12th right now, getting close to that top 10. I think it, just, it depends on what happens. I think that if, you know, if they go undefeated, that it, I don't think it'll hurt because they go undefeated win the Big 12 championship game, you're probably going to have – two wins are for over Oklahoma, so I don't really see how they could keep West Virginia out with that. But, I mean, if it's a situation right. where West Virginia has, you know, one loss to Oklahoma, then loses to Oklahoma in the Big 12 championship game, you know, who gets in then? And it's not, it's not going to be West Virginia. So I think it could hurt uh, those chances more than I think um, that, you know, a lot of people are saying it could hurt Will Greer's Heisman chances. And I tend to think that it, it, it's probably not going to really affect his Heisman chances too much, and especially because I think he's going to put up – good numbers nonetheless still yet and you know if his numbers are better than some of the other guys even in one less game that's gonna that's gonna bode better for him even and and you know you can still figure it up on per game averages even though he's playing one less game so I mean you think it's gonna affect his Heisman chances any? I know I think exactly what you said is exactly what I've been thinking of um, if if he's got the same you know he can still have the same or even better numbers as some of the guys he's going up against and, you know, Drew Locke and Trace Maturely, I think if he's got the same kind of numbers as them, you can't argue if he's, you know, played one last game got the same kind of numbers as them, you know. Yeah, I'm right there and with you on that. He's definitely on his way, too. Yeah, I think so. I think he's one of the favorites right now. You know, I've heard a lot of talk about, you know, Tua at Alabama and uh, Haskins at Ohio State, and I think that uh, – Playing for Alabama is actually going to hurt to uh, more than help them because you know they're winning these games by a lot. So 
I don't see how he could win the Heisman when he's averaging, you know, like 190 yards a game. Like, they've played three games, and he still doesn't have as many yards or touchdowns as Will Greer does. So, I think, you know, just on individual performance, Will Greer's guy, you got to favor him over Tua. I mean, Tua's a great quarterback, but what Tua has around him is a lot, lot better. Yeah, and as great as quarterback as Tua is, he's still, you know, playing alongside Jalen Hurts, and he's sharing time with him. And, you know, I think that hurts him a lot more than it helps him. In terms of Heisman, you know. Absolutely, I think. I mean, I think you got to think Will Greer is the favorite right now, and it just depends on if West, West Virginia does going forward in the season, especially in those November games. You know, if if he if he shows out in those November games and puts up good numbers, I don't see how he can't finish top three in that Heisman. You know, regardless, I don't think losing this game and not getting to play it's going to hurt him. No, I definitely agree. Definitely agree. All right, let's get into this next segment here. Uh, we like to call more or less, and uh, I'm going to throw out some numbers and some stats, and uh, we're both going to say if we think that that number will increase and be higher and more at the end of the season or if it will decrease and be less by the end of the season. Uh, start off with uh, West Virginia's points per game on offense. Right now they're averaging 46 points per game. Do you think it will be more than that or less than that by the season's end? I'm going to say less just because they're going to be getting into tougher competition coming up this week against uh, Kansas State and getting into the Big 12. Right. Um, I could, I don't want to say much less. I would even say around the same. But uh, I'd be shocked if, this, if I seen that number go up. Yeah, I, I'm right there with you. I think I don't think it's going to be uh, more, but I, I don't see it being too much less either. I think it'll be right around there. Uh, Holgerson mentioned in the off season, you know, they averaged you know 35, 36 points a game last year, but he said felt they needed to get about 10 more to be about 45, 46 because that's what Oklahoma and Oklahoma State were averaging last year, and they're right there at it. So I mean, if it goes down, I still think you see it somewhere around uh, 40, 45 range, and if, if West Virginia's having a successful season, it, it should be right right in there. Next number. Uh, I definitely agree. Yeah, for sure. It's 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 the thing of they're being more efficient on offense this year. So you know the point the it's producing more points because they're not boom or bust. You know last year a lot of times it was three and out or touchdown, and this time they're they're putting together longer drives and being more efficient, which is helping create more points. Yeah, definitely. I, I noticed last year you'd see a lot of bigger you'd see a lot of bigger plays. But then you'd see drives stall out over time just because they couldn't get the run game going. But this year, it, it, they can pretty much do whatever they want, it seems. Absolutely. So <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, next number is uh, WU's yards per play right now. Um, so far this season, they're averaging 8.2 yards per play. And that's a significant number because last season, Oklahoma actually set the NCAA record for highest yards per play average in a season, and it was 8.1. So West Virginia right now is right on pace and actually a little bit ahead of that at 8.2 yards per play. So you think that number will be more or less by season's end? Uh, I, I would be truly amazed to see us stay around the same as it is right now. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to go down, like I said, getting into this kind of tough competition. It's going to see – you're going to see that number drop. I, I think I'm right there with you. I think it'll be less. Um, that 8.1 yards per play Oklahoma did last year was really, really astonishing almost. And, um, you know, to see West Virginia do that through two games is great, but you got to look at the competition. You know, uh, Tennessee um, maybe better than people expected a little bit, but, you know, still not Tennessee of, of that they usually are. And then Youngstown State. But I think it'll drop some. I think you'll see it somewhere in the in the sevens probably. I think they'll still have a high yards per play, you know, maybe in the sevens and maybe approaching that eight. But I don't think they'll match what Oklahoma did last year when they averaged that 8.1. No, I definitely agree. All right, then uh, next. It was magical. Yeah, that came last year. That offense was something something special. You know, if they if they could uh, ever find a defense over there at Oklahoma, they, you know, uh, Baker Mayfield should have had them a national championship ring if they could have had a defense that would have stopped anybody the past couple of years. You know, I think mm -hmm. if they'd had a defense either one of those years, he might he might have won. Especially last year when you know what they did to Georgia and stuff. They, that's a game that I felt like they should have won. That's real impressive. Yeah, I think a lot of people think they should have won that game. Yeah, they let that one slip away for sure. Um, yeah, they did. Next number I got here is uh, West Virginia's rushing yards per game. Uh, right now on the season, they're sitting at 203.5 rushing yards a game. Uh, you know, that's not too bad, but I, I don't know. I think I'm going to go ahead and say I think it may be more by season's end. I think they can get up maybe, you know, 220 or something like that. But 
the the thing that I like this year is that I think the offense has you know a loaded backfield and uh, I think that they're focusing more on running the ball. Last year I think they got away from it a little bit uh, too much and I think they're trying to go for more balance this year and uh, you know they're the type of team that I think you know if, if you want to play a lot of guys in the box they'll, they can throw it 50 times a game but if you want to play to stop the pass they can run it 50 times a game and be effective either way. So I'm actually going to go with more on those rush yards a game. Uh, what about you Steven? Uh, I'm going to go the same. I was going to say, uh, I think as you get down, you know, get deeper into the season and people start keying on you more and, you know, the passing game and what we all know West, West Virginia will is a passer. Absolutely. Uh, the more the more we pass it, the more we're going to uh, key on that. So I think West Virginia is going to adjust and try to uh, get the run game going a little bit more, especially if Alex Seinfeld stays healthy. I know it kind of scared, got us scared two weeks ago, but um, if he can stay healthy and we can keep all those – Guys in the backfield stable would be pretty good. Yes, yeah, I hate to see that with Sinkfield ankle injury because you know he's he looks like he's going to be the big play guy and uh, he's explosive. So you know I think I think not playing this NC State game is going to benefit him and you know maybe he'll only miss another game or so uh, with that you know ankle sprain because those are tough to come back from, especially with a player like him that uses his speed and explosiveness. Yeah, he was looking to have a pretty good breakout season this year too. Yeah, that running back room's loaded for sure. See, uh, next number I got here is uh, third down conversion rate, and uh, it's a pretty big stat because last year that was somewhere the West Virginia struggled and they wanted to focus on the offseason. You've heard the key words from the coaches all offseason be just to get more efficient on offense, and so far I think they've done a good job of that. They sit at 60% third down conversion rate so far, uh, more or less by season's end on that, Stephen. Uh, I'm going to say... I'm going to say more. I think as the season goes along, um, it's just, if the offense stays healthy, I think that the uh, I thought that we get more efficient, if, if that's possible. Um, I, I really do. I think if we stay healthy down down the stretch, we can we can be one of the best offenses not only in the country but in school history. Uh, I'm right there with you, especially you know, like I said earlier, this offense has been more efficient. That you can tell that they've put the work in there to do that and. And, you know, the way the offense is playing, I think it's helping the whole team more, you know, helping the defense not be on the field as much and sustaining longer drives. And these critical downs, you know, these third downs, they're they're 60% right now. And I'm, I'm with you. I think I'm going to go more. I think they can get up maybe even close to 70% on that And because I think they're going to continue to improve as the season goes along and some of these young players come along and they just develop more chemistry. And, you know, that's they're, it's been a big focus for them, and I think it will continue to be and they'll continue to improve each week on that. And I, I'm going to go with you on more. Let's talk about the talk about the defense now. Uh, it's a unit a lot of people had questions about, and through the first couple games, albeit against some uh, lesser offenses, it, they've been pretty impressive. Uh, right now, their points per game, they're only giving up 15 and a half points per game, uh, more or less on that by season's end. Um, I think I will, I will start off by saying this. I think that it has the defense has played lights out. I don't. I know it's against lesser defenses, but they have played. Very tremendously for, through the first two games. Um, I do think that they're going to give up more points going down just because when we, get, you know, the offenses oh, yeah. that play in the Big 12 are by far and away better um, than the ones than we have played in the first two games. Um, but like I said, uh, I think this defense, especially with Zeke Rose up there and Kenny Bigelow, them two have just spearheaded that defense this year. And uh, I think they're going to surprise some people going down going down the stretch. I'm right there with you. I, you know, I was I was big on this defense through the off season uh, from the things I heard, and uh, they've even impressed me more than I than I thought they would. And 15 and a half, you know, of course I'm right with you. I'm with you. I'm have to say that's going to be more just because, like you said, these Big 12 offenses are always impressive. And you know, in the Big 12, if you've got a top 30 or top 40 defense in the country, you're doing really good because it's hard to do that in the Big 12. And in the Big 12, you're going to give up points. You're going to give up yards. It's it's more about forcing turnovers and getting the critical stops on third downs and getting off the field as much as you can. But yeah, that number's definitely going to go up. But I'm right there with you. This defense has been impressive, and I think that they're going to continue to turn some heads as as the season goes along. Yeah, they're exciting to watch. For sure. Next number I got is uh, defensive yards per game. Uh, right now they're giving up 309.5. You're going more or less on that? Uh, along with the scoring numbers, I think that that number is also going to go up. Uh, like I said, the offenses, the offenses in the Big 12 are just uh, too good to shut down completely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I would love to see it. 
Yeah, I'll, I'm right there with you. You know, 309.5 yards per, uh, per game given up. If, if they could keep, you know, around that rate in the Big 12, that'd be phenomenal. But I'm with you. I think it's going to be more. But I think that they're <clears throat> definitely going to improve to what they did last year. I think last year they gave up almost 400 some. I think they'll definitely improve on that. And, um, you know, this defense has a chance to really turn some heads going forward is like they have in the first two weeks. But I think that's going to go, um, go up as well. And then <clears> – <throat> Third down uh, con conversion rate from the defense, you know, like I said, that's a pretty critical stat, especially in the Big 12, is being able to get off the field on third down and fourth down. And uh, under Tony Gibson, West Virginia has done a good job of that, albeit last year they took a step back. Um, but I think that's an outlier. And uh, right now they're sitting at 34.6%, the offenses that they're facing are only converting 34.6% of the third down attempts. Uh, do you think that'll be more or less by season's end? Um, I'm on the fence with this. I'm gonna I'm gonna say it stays around the same. Um, I I, I want to say that, you know we're gonna give up a little bit more just because like I said I keep saying it's the Big Twelve offenses, but but I Absolutely. think if the if the defense can gain confidence over the season, you know, and the offense they can keep working off the offense the way that they have, um, you know, they might have the confidence to be able to, to keep getting off the field. I think so too. You know that's. Tony Gibson's big focus is always getting that defense off the field on, and then third downs. And uh, I'm right there with you. I, I think that it's going to be right around that mark. Uh, I'm thinking, you know, 35 to 40 percent they can hold hold teams. You know, they're right there at 34.6. So I might go a little bit more, but not much. Pretty pretty close in there. I think that they've put a good focus on that, and they're going to continue to perform well in that aspect. Oh yeah. Um, let's talk individually right now. Uh, some stats and do more or less on this. Um, Letty Brown, he's been really impressive as a true freshman so far and uh, turned a lot of heads. Right now he's averaging 74 rushing yards a game through these first two games. Do you think he'll average more or less than that as the season goes on? Uh, I'm going to say more. I think with, as the season goes on, they're going to be giving him more touches, um, if, especially if we see Alex Seinfeld, you know, lose playing time due to, due to his injury. Uh, Letty Brown has shown nothing but promise. I think that's probably the best back that I've seen that young um, probably since Steve Slate or Noah Devine. Uh, that kid is, is just very, very talented, truly special player. I think he's going to do special things for us this year. Absolutely. I'm right there with you. I'm going to go ahead and say more, too. Um, and, you know, like you said, most talented young true freshman running back I've seen since Slate and Ann Devine. And, you know, the thing that really turns my head about him and impresses me about him is this, this the way he's built, you know, over 210 pounds already as a true freshman, and, and that's without even going through an off season. you know, didn't get here until the summer, you know, didn't roll early, so we didn't get here until summer right before fall camp, and, and to pick up on the offense as quick as he has and uh, with his hard-nosed style, I think he's got the makings of maybe by season's end being the, a back that gets the most carries game in and game out, because I think by the time his career is done at West Virginia, he's the type of running back you can give the ball to, you know, 20 times a game. He's just that type of player, and, and I think he's Rushing yards are going to go up this season and, you know, continue to improve throughout his career. But 74 right now, and I think that he's got the potential to average anywhere from 80 to, to 90 yards a game by season's end. Yeah, and then, then moving Kennedy McCoy to the uh, – that's pretty much mainly a slot receiver. Uh, so the way it's kind of looking – uh, right now, that's going to help him out a lot too. Yeah, I think so too. I think I think they're they're liking the 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 power that Letty Brown and Martel Petaway are showing, and then kind of using Sinkfield as that change of pace, and then McCoy is more of the pass catcher, and then bringing McCoy in sometimes late in games in the backfield where he has those fresh legs and can try and wear down the defense and close out the games because you know he's one of the he's probably the most experienced, so he's the guy that you can trust and don't have to worry about him missing assignments or nothing late in games when you're trying to close those out. And then uh, Will Greer, uh, you know, can't say enough about Will Greer and how impressive he's been. Uh, he was great last year, even better this year. And, you know, the thing they talked with him about yet again was efficiency and, and, you know, not having to make the big play all the time and trusting his playmakers and spreading the ball around. And he's really done that. And so through two games, he sits at 76.6 completion uh, percentage, uh, more or less on that by season's end. Uh, I'm going to say around the same or more. Uh, I don't see, unless he gets injured, I don't see Will Greer dropping off income soon. He has no, hasn't shown any signs of it yet. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm going to go slightly less, but I still think he'll sit somewhere between 70 to 75. So I'll go a little less, but not much. And I'm right there with you. I don't see him dropping off too much just because 
there's no way that, that you can really – you can't – there's too many weapons on the offense to be able to shut Will Greer down because there's too many receivers for him to throw to, and, and even the running backs can catch passes. And, you know, you can double-team one of the receivers, but there's three or four really good ones on this team. So it's just pick your poison. If you double-team one, you're just leaving the other ones open. So it's – it's it's easy for him to just find somebody open in this offense, and I think that completion percentage is going to stay high because of that. Yeah, I feel like it. It seems like every time he throws the ball downfield, or anybody, somebody new catches it. Uh, who was it? Dominic Maiden called a pass Dominic, last week. Yep, got his first um, touchdown. First time I've heard that name. Yep. Um, Big play. Of course, we, we knew T.J. Simmons was coming into the game in Tennessee. He got his first one uh, there, but. It just, uh, it just seems like any time he throws the ball downfield, somebody's going to catch it no matter who it is. It doesn't right, matter that's if it's a big name or a small name. Exactly. It's just weapons all over the field. And then uh, next I've got Greer's uh, yards per game. Right now he's sitting at 380.5 passing yards per game. Uh, pretty high up near 400. Uh, seen him go over 400 once this year already, something he didn't get last year, even though he had a lot of 300-yard uh, games. Uh, so many that he has uh, seven 300-yard games away from the most in a career at West Virginia right now. And uh, I think he may get that record. But uh, 380.5 yards per game is pretty high. I'm going to say slightly less. I see him sitting somewhere around 350, 360 um, for the season probably. Uh, what are you going to say there, more or less on 380.5? Uh, I'm going to agree. I'm going to go less. Uh, I think it's more around the 325, 350 mark, anywhere in between there. Uh, I think that's where you're going to see him sit around most of the season. It may fluctuate, but as an average, I think that's where you're going to see him at. I can see that. I can see that. Um, then uh, receiver-wise, uh, Gary Jennings has uh, been impressive this year. He's, you know, he's always been Mr. Consistent, but now he's showing uh, an ability to get into the end zone. And uh, after only having one touchdown all of last season, so far this season he's averaging two touchdowns a game, uh, more or less on that number for him by the season's end. Um, I'm going to say less. Uh, I think he's got a nose for the end zone more than, than he did last year just because t I guess he's been picked on through the offseason for getting over one last year. <laughs> um, but he seems to have, uh, to have embraced it and tried to uh, get in there more. He's got there, what, three times so far? Um, I think four times. Four, four times, yeah. Three, three in, the, in the one game and then one in the first. Yeah, so he's already tripled his total from last year. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't see him averaging two a game, but I do expect him to get in on a lot more this year. I think so too. I'm, I'm going to say less also just because it, it, it can vary game to game. You know, like I said, he had three touchdowns last game, but next game he could have zero and Seals could have two and Sims could have one. I think there's like, just with the so many, as many weapons as there are again that it's going to be hard for any receiver right. to average a lot of touchdowns. And, you know, it's, that's the difference from this year as opposed to last year. Last year, you know, it was Sills and Jennings, and Sims had a decent year, but I think he's going to have an even better year this year. And this year you can't key on any one guy. He's worth really spreading the ball around, so I think that's going to make that number go down a little bit. And, you know, the stats of Jennings and Seals may not be as high as they were last year, but I think that's going to be because the other receiver stats are going to be even greater as we, as we spread the ball around and get more efficient on offense this season. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, which brings me to the next number, which is David Seals. He's sitting at uh, averaging one touchdown a game right now. Um, he had two in the first game and then none last game. Uh, do you uh, think that he's going to stay at uh, that one touchdown a game average or be more than that? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay at the same. I'm going to go right at one. Because like you say, there's too many, offense, I mean, too many offensive weapons uh, for them to go to when they start keying on Seals. Yeah. Um, the first game, Seals just was a man. <laughs> that's like always. Him. And in the second game, I feel like that's all that they wanted to do was key on uh, Seals, and so that opened up Sims and, you know, Jennings and everybody else up. I'm right there. I, I, see, I see where you're coming from. I'm going to actually say more on the – more than one touchdown a game he's going to average by season's end because – um, I think right now in the beginning of the season you're seeing a lot of teams key on David Seals um, because the year he had last year with 18 touchdowns and being a Blitnikoff finalist. But I think that's really allowing the emergence of Gary Jennings and Marcus Sims. And so I think going forward you may see te uh, teams key on any one of them. And uh, 
things are going to open up more for Stills as the season goes on, I believe, as well as him learning how to adjust to a team's double team on him and stuff. I think he'll be able to find his way back into the end zone and average, you know, maybe a, a touchdown and a half per game or two touchdowns per game. So I'm going to go a little bit more on that one. I can see it. I can see it. Um, a surprise for a lot of people is uh, Kennedy McCoy not getting a lot of use in the backfield. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, right now he sits at seven and a half carries a game only, uh, more or less on that by season's end. Um, depending on the injury with Alex Infield and how, extent, how uh, extenuous that is, um, I'm going to say more. Um, if, if we have less running backs in the backfield, Kennedy's going to have to make up a little bit of that load just to help them out, but um, if, if Alex stays healthy, I, I, I see them using Kennedy as more of a slot receiver um, um, and just, you know, a guy that they can use in running back position when they need experience back there, like on third down conversions and things like that. Right. I'm, I'm going to go uh, more also. I think, you know, seven and a half is kind of low, but you also got to think that's splitting in between four backs. We've played all four running backs in both games. And, uh, but I think, I think part of that is, you know, Kenny McCoy had that shoulder injury last year, and I think that he's still kind of recovering from that, maybe not quite 100% yet. And so I think as the season goes on, he'll get more carries, and I think that he, he, he'll be the, like I said earlier, he'll be the closer. So I think in, late in the games he's going to get some carries, and I think you'll see that seven and a half carries go up slightly, maybe up closer to ten carries a game by season's end. Um, big thing in the offseason a lot of people talked about was uh, West Virginia trying to incorporate the tight ends more. And uh, you've seen that with mixed results through these first two games. Um, as the tight ends right now sit averaging two catches a game uh, for, the, for the tight end position. Uh, you see the two catches a game for a tight end going up and being more, or do you see them averaging less than that as the season goes on? Uh, I see it being more. Uh, I think when you start playing teams like Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, um, Kansas State even, um, these are teams that all use bigger tight ends, and I think West Virginia is, they've recruited these guys that kind of match that and get some size at that position as well. And uh, Trayvon Wesco seems to be a pretty good option to go to, so hopefully he he steps up to a plate. Yeah, I'm right there. I think I'm going to go more, too. Uh, like you said, Wesco, and he's really impressed me a lot because I was big on on Giovanni Haskins, the Miami transfer in the offseason, and I think he's going to come along more as the season goes on. But uh, I kind of saw Wesco as more of a blocker, but he's really showed that he has some athleticism to him, and he can be a heck of a pass catcher himself. And, um, you know, two receptions a game, that equal out to about, I think, 20, 24 or something like that for the season. And I see the tight ends catching anywhere from – 35 to 50 passes in total maybe by the time the season ends. And I think that there's some packages that they have for these tight ends that West Virginia hasn't shown yet, and they're saving it for some of these bigger Big 12 games and going to probably see some big plays from these tight ends going forward. Yeah, I think Gary Jennings made the comment a, a week ago. Um, they asked him how, how, uh, how much of the offense that we have shown so far has been new. And he said 25%, and I think – I think about 50% of what we haven't seen is is tight ends, you know, oh, yeah. giving them their plays. That's that's scary for uh, defensive coordinators right there is that West Virginia still has a lot of tricks up their sleeve. Absolutely. All right, let's talk some uh, individuals on defense. Uh, when we talk West Virginia defense, you got to talk David Long. And uh, so far he's been really impressive he, through these first two games. 11 and a half tackles a game is what he's averaging. Uh, more or less on that for him by season's end. No, I would love to see it be more, but, but uh, that, I think anybody with a logical state of mind is going to say less. Yeah, that's a heck of a pace. If he's, if he's doing more than that, that's something special. But, Absolutely. And he, he, he makes a lot of tackles, but I'm there with you. It's going to have to be less than that by, by the season's end. Although I think he's going to be, you know, having a, a lot of double-digit tackle games, especially with – um, how thin West Virginia is at linebacker position after some of these injuries they've suffered. And so he's going to have to pick up the slack even more. But uh, I think, yeah, definitely less than 11 and a half a game. Yeah. Um, defensively, uh, one of the most impressive things we've seen is how they've been able to get into the opposing offenses, backfields, and get tackles for a loss. Um, sitting at top 10 in the country in tackles for a loss total. And the defense as a whole right now is averaging 10 and a half tackles for loss per game through these first two games. Um, more or less on that number by season's end. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say less. Um, I think the defense continues to get better, but 
uh, I think these two, these Big 12 offenses are just too overpowering to get in the backfield as much as we have been getting back there. Um, I think that our defensive line, if they can, if they can stay healthy, uh, they can continue to get a good push back there, though. I think so too. I'm going to go less as well, just because um, that number is pretty high. You know, ten and a half on average through the first two games. I think they have 21 total tackles for a loss, but it's also high because. Tennessee and Youngstown State are teams that predominantly try and run the football and getting in the Big 12, you're not going to see teams do that as much. You know, of course you have a couple that still do try and run the ball a lot in, you know, Kansas State and Texas, but for the most part, the Big 12 wants to spread you out and pass, and so it's going to be harder to get as many tackles for a loss when the team's not trying to line up and run it as much, so I'm going to go less on that as well. And especially if our secondary stays, um, stays the way they are because they've been giving up some some pretty big pass plays. Yeah, that's 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 the one question I think I still have left on the defense is is this secondary uh, going forward. And I, that's one of the things I was looking forward to in that NC State game was seeing them face a, a good passing offense, and I kind of wish they would have gotten to play that just for the experience. But, you know, I, of course I understand with the hurricane and stuff, there's no way you could you could have played it. But as far as for the corners, it would have definitely been good for, for their progression. Yeah, I was definitely looking forward to that. Looking forward to going down to Raleigh and watching that one. It's kind of heartbreaking to see that. Yeah, hopefully they still come up to Morgantown next season. We get to see a, see that matchup because I think it'll be a good matchup. I think it will be too. I think so. Uh, next number I got is uh, most carries in a game by one back, and right now that number sits at 15, and that was Lady Brown against Youngstown State. So 15 carries, uh, more or less, uh, for a back as by the time the season goes on. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's gonna be more. Uh, I think, like I said earlier, I think Lady Brown's gonna establish himself a little bit more as the season goes along. Um, once he gets a little bit more comfortable with the offense, um, I think he's gonna be a, a scary, scary sight to see for for defenses. Absolutely. Next number I got here is longest rush so far this year for West Virginia, and that was 26 yards, and that was last game by Kennedy McCoy against Youngstown State. Uh, more, uh, bigger run than that by the se time the season's over? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I th I'm going to say we, we're going to have a couple breakout plays this year for longer yards. I, I can, if, if the way they're playing now, it's going to foretell anything in the future. I think so as well. Uh, you know, that's – especially if, sink, if, if and when Sinkfield comes back, I think he's got the – the possibility to break a real bit, a real long run, you know. So 26 yards isn't that long, and I'm gonna definitely say that they can break a bigger one than that by season's end. Uh, pass attempts, uh, the most we've had so far this season is 34 by Will Greer. Uh, when you get into Big 12 play, and you know you, you get them have some of these shootouts, maybe you think they're gonna Will Greer's gonna throw for more than 34 times in a game? I think multiple times this year he's going to. <laughs> uh, uh. When you get into the teams like Oklahoma, um, you know, the teams that score at the same kind of a pace that we do, there's going to be no other option uh, than to just sling it downfield, and I think they're going to not be afraid at all to do that. I yeah. wouldn't be shocked to see that number up in the 40s. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I was going to say more, and I was going to say, you know, somewhere, you know, I, I definitely think y'all he'll have at least a couple games where he throws over 40 passes and maybe even gets up close to 50 if we need him to. Because he's, I mean, he can def he's definitely got the ability to do so. I, he did it a couple games last year. I think he had over 45 attempts. So I definitely think be more on that number. Um, next number I got is uh, touchdown passes in a game. And uh, that number's sitting at five right now. Uh, do you think Will Weir throws over five touchdown passes in a single game going forward? Hmm. I can see it happening. Um, I'm going to say right at five. Um, he, he can possibly get up to six, maybe seven, depending on what kind of, you know, who we're playing that day. I think if you're playing tech, Kansas, of course, I don't know what the way Kansas has been playing earlier in the season. I uh, think might not roll over for us this year, it seems like. Yeah, they're, they're looking pretty good, especially um, on D. But uh, I do, I think what, I think Greer has the opportunity to have more than that this year. Yeah, I'm going to agree with that and say that he's probably going to get more. We've seen him throw five touchdown passes in a game quite a few times now. I actually believe he holds a school record or is tied for it in most five touchdown pass games, I think. And so 
I think later on in the season, like you said, when you're playing, you know, one of these teams, maybe a Texas Tech or an Oklahoma or somebody that airs it out a lot and you get in a shootout, I, I, I could see him definitely getting six touchdown passes, you know, maybe even that seven mark. So I'm going to say more there as well. Longest passing play of the year so far has been 59 yards. Uh, do you think West Virginia has a longer one than that by the time the season's over? No, I think so. Uh, you have the speed on the outside with Marcus Sims, uh, TJ Simmons even with the speed he has, and David Seals. Uh, I think you're going to see a few big plays this year. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go more there as well. I I see you know West Virginia at some point in this thing they're going to break a have a 60 or 70 yard or something like that and get get a longer passing play than that in. Um, most receptions by receiver so far this year is actually only single digits as Marcus Sims has eight. Is somebody going to have uh, more than that? I could see, I can definitely see it happen. Uh, Gary Jennings has the most potential out of all of them, if not, if not David Seals. Yeah, I, I agree. I know I know Gary Jennings and him, him both had a couple, a uh, few games last year where they had double-digit receptions, and Gary Jennings is a guy that can catch catch a lot of passes, and so I definitely see uh, probably both of them getting double-digit reception games as this season goes along. Um, highest receiving yards by a receiver uh, so far is 140 by Steels in the opener against Tennessee. Um, somebody going to get more than 140 yards this year? Uh, yep, I definitely think so. I'm, I'm agree with that. I, I, I think that somebody definitely gets over – uh, 140, and I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we see somebody push that 200-yard range, uh, receiving-wise, probably. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm, I wouldn't be shocked to see it up to 200, 250s. Right on. Um, touchdown receptions. Um, Gary Jennings had three last game we mentioned earlier. That's the most by receiver so far. Do you think anybody catches more than three touchdowns in a single game going forward? Um. I would love to say yes. I'm going to say no just because uh, I think we want to, when he gets in that type of game situation, we love to spread it out a little bit more. Uh, and Greer doesn't love to, he doesn't like to discriminate. So Yeah, exactly. I it's, think he'll spread that thing around. spread it out more than anything else. Right on. I'm going to agree with you. I think that that's probably going to be uh, the most we'll see. I think somebody may match that possibly. You know, Jennings may get three again, or we've seen Seals catch three in a single game before, but I don't think anybody's going to catch four or, or more, really. Uh, I'm going to go less as well and, and you know, say three or, three or less going forward. All right, uh, let's talk about some of these uh, position battles and some of the uh, just the season in general for West Virginia so far and, and what's happened and what we think about uh, some of these situations going forward. Um, starting off talking about the running back situation, I know we talked about it uh, briefly a little bit earlier, but uh, so far it's been basically by committee. All four running backs have played in both games. Um, you think they'll continue to use all the running backs? And um, if not, who do you think is going to separate themselves and is your favorite to you know, kind of be the feature back going forward? Uh, I think that they're going to use as many of the, back, of the backs as they can and as many games as they can. Um, with that said, I think Letty Brown is going to separate himself more so as the games go along. Uh, like I said, like, or more like you said, he hasn't been on campus but, you know, a couple months now, and he's already that good, you know, and that efficient in our offense. Imagine what he's going to do whenever he gets more comfortable and he knows our schemes and our, our plays uh, better than what he does now. Exactly. Uh, I, I'm right there with you. I think, I think it's kind of going to continue to be by committee, but I think, you know, when we get later in the season, you're going to see one guy getting the majority of the carries and just the other one's kind of coming in to give him a rest and, you know, be a change of pace when we need it. And I, my favorite is the same guy you're saying is Letty Brown because, like you said, he's only been here and he's still learning the offense and, um, you know, he's still learning the pass protection and stuff. I think once he gets down pass protection, he's going to play a whole lot more than uh, than he has already. And, and we've seen last game he was the first running back to get over 100 yards rushing on the season. And... Ah. I think that he's going to get 15 to 20 carries in some of these games going forward as he continues to improve. Um, next thing I want to talk about is the uh, cornerback situation. Uh, we mentioned, you know, they've looked kind of shaky so far in this season, and that's a concern going forward for sure, especially in the conference West Virginia plays in and, and how the Big 12 offenses like to pass. 
But uh, you've seen four guys get playing there, playing time there: uh, Josh Norwood, Hakeem Bailey, Derek Pitts, and then last game you've seen the other JUCO transfer, Keith Washington, get in there. And which of those two do you think looks the best, and and you like the most going forward? And and do you think this this position ha has enough talent there to be able to? keep West Virginia and keep some of these passing offenses at bay and help West Virginia win some of these games? Um, I think the best two that I've seen out there, um, I, well, the best one that I've seen out there is Hakeem Bailey. I think he's the best cornerback that I've seen play this year by far. Um, for the second one, I think it's tied actually between Keith Washington and Dariq Pitts. Uh, I know the last game it seemed like Dariq Pitts was all over the field and he was and on pretty much every single play, but it almost seemed like he was coming up short a little bit, if that makes sense. And it, I think that's more so just his youth. Um, I think Josh Norwood, <laughs> I think that's the, the worst one that I've seen. I don't want to talk bad about any of them, but uh, Josh Norwood, uh, it just seems like he's given too much of a cushion on, at times. Um, he, he seems mixed up on assignments at times. Um, I think those other three guys, if they can stay healthy, they, they could be pretty good. But we're going to need another fourth option uh, going going down the stretch because I just don't think – I don't see Josh Norwood uh, getting it done against some of these teams in the Big 12. Well, see, I, I'm actually thinking kind of the opposite. Like, I, I've, I've seen people, you know, complaining about Norwood, and uh, I've seen some of his struggles as well, but I also see a lot of potential there for Norwood. Um, you know, last game – you know, he's had some breakdowns in coverage, and, you know, last game we seen him get beat on a double double move a couple times. But I like the uh, aggressiveness of Josh Norwood. Um, you know, of course, I think that may have led to him getting beat on some of the double moves last game as they seen him trying to jump those routes. But I think that, that's, that it's good that that happened against a team like Youngstown State where it's not going to hurt you too much, especially when he was already ahead by a lot. And I think it's good to have that on film for him. And I think he can improve a lot going forward. Um, I think there's potential in, with these corners. Um, they're mainly young. Um, I think I'll, I like Norwood, but like you said, I like Derek Pitts, what he's shown, especially he's long and athletic. And uh, moving forward, I think he's only going to get better as he transitions over from that safety spot. And uh, I like Norwood, but I, I think I like Norwood as kind of the third corner. And I, I'm with you. I think Hakeem Bailey, he's had some struggles, but I think he's going to uh, continue to improve. And he's, he's improved from last season already. And I think that our, our corners are going to uh, step up when, he's, when it comes time to go up against these better passing offenses. And I, I like Bailey and, and Pitts the most. And I think Norwood and Washington can uh, get to a point where they can contribute as well. And I think going forward, if, if all four of those can progress, that I think we may be better than what it seems like we are right now. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, linebacker is a spot where – West Virginia was, was thin going into the season as they lost, you know, Quandarius Qualls and Brendan Ferns in the offseason. And then that situation got even worse in the first game when you seen Charlie Benton go down with a knee injury and he's out for the season. Uh, they're saying Qualls and Ferns may come back, but that's probably not going to be until October or November or later in the season. And uh, last game you've seen Giovanni Stewart move down from that bandit safety position and start at that Sam linebacker position. And so – my question is, uh, Giovanni Stewart, you know, he's only 5'8", about 195. Uh, can he hold up there all season at that linebacker spot, and is, is it realistic to rely on him going forward, or is the linebacker situation in trouble, do you think? Um, I know a lot of people hate on his size. Um, I'm going to say that I, I think that he can be a pretty reliable guy. With his speed, um, as, quickly as, he, as quickly as he moves around, as tough as he is, um, unless he gets hurt, I think, I think we could – be looking at a really good linebacker, uh, a linebacker option. I th I th you you got to think, David Long isn't that isn't really that big either, but he's one of the best linebackers in the country. I mean, it's all due to and part of to his speed. Absolutely, I think that's one thing I've seen from the West Virginia defense is it's probably the fastest West Virginia defense I've seen in, in a few years, and I think that's going to bode well going forward. And I think I'm with you. I think Javonte Stewart's athleticism can. Um, can really help him a lot. And you've seen West Virginia have success with linebackers like that that are maybe not the biggest, but um, they play, they're play they athletic and they play fast and they play hard. And I think Javonte Stewart, you've seen him, he was around the ball a ton in that Youngstown State game. And it was good for him to get yeah, in there sure. and get the reps in that game. And uh, I think, you know, uh, it just depends on who you're matching up with. I think, you know, coming up against Kansas State, run more of a power offense, he might not get as many snaps. But 
Uh, I think you'll see him have the majority of the snaps at that spot, but I think you'll also see it kind of be split between him and, and Shea Campbell and maybe Exry Low if he can come around too. But I don't think it's uh, as bad of a situation as it looks on paper, and I think that West Virginia can, can do things, and I'm sure Tony Gibson has tricks up his sleeves and, and is planned for this and, and knows, knows what he wants to do going forward. And you've seen West Virginia go four down linemen some this season too and only run two linebackers with Tonkery and Long, and so I think you'll see that look some as well as uh, Stewart factoring in, and I think the linebacker situation will be all right going forward. I think that especially if Qualls and Ferns can come back by November when you get into them tough four games as you face TCU, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and Texas, that that could help a lot too. Yeah, I also think Dylan Tockery, I think he, he's a really, a very underestimated linebacker on our defense. Uh, he's not quite as good as his brother was, but I think that he, he isn't getting as much of attention as what he deserves over these past, or the, you know, over the first two weeks. I th- yeah, exactly. And he's, he's really solid and he's young and only going to get better, especially, you know, this being his first year playing that Mike linebacker in the middle. And... Um, he's, he's a guy that you know, may not show up a lot in the stat sheet, but he's a guy that doesn't miss his assignments and, and does his job a lot, and that's, and that's all what you need from that position. Exactly. All right. Uh, my next thing is what about this team uh, has surprised you that maybe you didn't see coming, uh, coming into this season? Um, I wouldn't say that it was a surprise for me to see the defensive line do as well as they are, but I think um, – they're doing a lot better than I expected them to do. That's the biggest surprise for me so far, is how well the defensive line has executed their plays. Uh, they get, they've been getting back there more um, than I've seen in recent years, especially in the past two years. Um, I, I, they had nowhere to go but up, but I think that this that defensive front is truly something special. I don't think I've seen a defensive front that special since um, Bruce Irvin played. Absolutely. I mean, I agree right there. I agree with you on that. I think that this is one of the better defensive lines, definitely under Tony Gibson, and I think it's one of the better defensive lines West Virginia has had maybe in school history. It's it's up there, you know, with the talent they have and, you know, the size that they have as well. And um, a lot of them guys, you know, are, are young when you look at guys like Dante Stills and uh, Reese Donahue, and, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be pl- uh, players going forward. And I think both the Stills brothers are going to be, uh, be really good going forward for West Virginia. Uh, one thing that surprised me, though, is um, they kind of, you know, the way that uh, the they all changed the offense up a little bit. You know, it's it's a little bit more what I expected the offense to look like last year, and uh, they didn't really talk about it in the offseason. Just kind of, um, they had mentioned it in the pregame leading up to the Tennessee game, but up until then they kind of kept it hush hush. But they've, you know, run a lot of tight formations, a lot of 12 personnel, two tight ends, and um, kind of a mixture of what you've seen the offense run in 2016 when they were running that power game with uh, Skylar Howard as the quarterback and then with still with the spread that they had last year. And it's kind of like they've molded those two offenses together. And I really like what I'm seeing in those formations and the style that they're running on their offense. Yeah, I'm loving the offense so far. It seems like the, the offense can do no wrong. Yeah. The, and that, uh, with the exception of a couple of uh, start-out drives that I really don't think, you know, was in their control, I think they have looked lights out. Yeah, that's uh, – that's what, I, that's what I think, too. You know, they've preached efficiency, and it's really shown. And, and the way that they're kind of slowing things down and not moving at a breakneck pace is helping the defense out, and it's helping the whole team out. And I think that it's the way that they've changed the offense is really focused on trying to win more games and, and more so than, you know, having big plays is being more efficient and trying to help the team out more and trying to lead to more wins. Um, outside of Will Greer and David Long, um, who do you think is your uh, – most impressive player on offense and your most impressive player on defense so far? Uh, on defense, I'm going um, to I'm going to say Derek Pitts. Derek Pitts, uh, especially in the Youngstown State game, has played lights out. For as young as he is, I think that he's the sky's the limit for that kid. He's, he's been doing a great job. Um, on offense, we've been preaching it all day long. I, I think it's got to be Letty Brown. He's, Absolutely. He's came to play Every time he stepped on the field in Morgan County this year. Absolutely. I'm going to agree with you on offense, uh, Letty Brown, for me, too. Uh, uh, I talked a lot about Sinkfield, and uh, throughout the offseason, he was, he was kind of the talk. And, and then Letty Brown gets on campus, and you start hearing a lot about him. And uh, I, he's really impressed me a lot. Uh, he's better than I even expected him to be, and uh, definitely the most impressive player on offense. Uh, and then defensive-wise for me, uh, Kenny Bigelow, uh, you know, is – 
what can else can you say? He's been living in the uh, opponent's backfields from the very first snap of the game against Tennessee. He's oh, made yeah. an impact, and that guy's uh, something special. And you know, I don't remember West Virginia having a, a nose tackle uh, to make that big of an impact since probably Chris Neal, I'd say. Yeah, he's made probably a bigger impact than Neal, I would say. I think so, you know, especially with the way he's been getting tackles for a loss and stuff because a lot of times you see, you know, that which, that guy doesn't get a lot of stats. He kind of just hold, takes on blockers and plugs up holes and lets everyone else get in there. But he's been fighting through double teams and still getting back there and making plays. And he, Kenny Bigelow has been really impressive. Um, I know when yeah, our, Kenny Bigelow and Andrew uh, – I can't wait to see what Will Robertson has whenever he gets in there. Yeah. Reese Donahue has also been another – yeah, Reese Donahue was. Well, I was thinking about picking him as well because uh, he's put on a lot of size and he's really shown that size and strength and been able to get in the backfield and get tackles for a loss as well. And I've been really impressed uh, impressed by Reese too. Yeah, Reese has been a man back there. I know in our prediction show we both uh, predicted ten and two, and uh, through two games, or uh, obviously, of course, we're both going to be wrong there because we're only playing eleven games going forward. But uh, do you think that uh, you're going to change? And you, and you see the losses coming in different places than you did originally, or maybe see more losses or, or less losses now after watching the, this team for two games? Uh, I'm going to go actually one less loss. Uh, after seeing Texas State play the first two weeks, I don't think that the, I don't think that they're going to give West Virginia as much trouble as I thought they would. Uh, I still think that we lose to Oklahoma in that, in that final game. Uh, um, but Texas Tech, I actually changed that one to a win. I, I see that. I could definitely see that. You know, their offense looks pretty good, but their defense, which was supposed to be improved this year, does not look improved. And uh, Tony Gibson usually uh, has a plan and, and slows that offense down uh, per, uh, at least enough, you know, to, to get a win usually. So I could see that. Um, as for me, I, you know, I had losses to Texas and Oklahoma. Um, I think that that Texas game, we've got a good chance of winning actually. Um, so I'm going to go right with you and say, you know, one loss for right now for me too, and that's being that Oklahoma game at the end of the season. Um, so with that being said, uh, what do you think to you will constitute a successful season this year that at the end of the year, uh, is there a certain number of wins or a certain achievement for this team to make uh, for, in your eyes, this season to be considered successful and not be considered a letdown? Uh, I, say, I say we got at least 10 wins. Anything less than 10 wins uh, is is probably a failure in my eyes. As a fan that's been watching this team for so long, I think and if you have anything less than that, um, I think they have a strong chance of getting more than 10 wins. But if you look at the talent that West Virginia had a few years ago with Skylar Howard and all them, um, they got 10 wins. And this team is by far and away better than that team was. So not to say that they should compare themselves to other teams in the past. But I think, you know, if you're looking at what you need to do in terms of being successful, I think 10 wins in the Big 12 championship, it would be successful for West Virginia. Absolutely. I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, I won't put a certain number of wins on it necessarily, but, you know, I think, you know, 10 is a good number. But for me, I think that, the thing that will make this a successful season nonetheless and not be considered a letdown is as I just want to see West Virginia play in, that, in the Big 12 championship game. I think with the team West Virginia has, they definitely should be in that Big 12 championship game at the end of the season. And I think if they're not in that Big 12 championship game, then you got to, you know, say that, to me that maybe it's just a little bit of a letdown, you know, because uh, if they get to that Big 12 championship game, even if they don't win it, there's a good chance that they're playing in a New Year's Six Bowl and, and, a, and a really good game there against a, against a quality opponent, which, which would be successful, especially with the, the team which Virginia has. But I think that you got to see them in that Big 12 championship game. Uh, I think so, too. I think a lot of people are agreeing with us on, on that as well. I think the, pro the projections that I've seen so far has been mostly – uh, All State Sugar Bowl and the Fiesta Bowl. Um, yeah. I don't think I've seen anything much lower than that. Maybe the Alamo Bowl, but uh, for the most part, it seems like everybody's pretty high up on West Virginia too. Exactly, because I mean, you want to see progression from this team. You know, like you said, that the ten wins uh, two years ago, and then before we, Will Rear went down last uh, last year, they were tied for. Uh, second in the Big 12 at that point, was still in and still in at the end. So, you know, I, I don't see no reason why they couldn't get up to that second place again. You know, this year after doing it, you know, being right there in the thick of the race the past two seasons, I think this has got to be the year where they get over the hump and, and get that second spot and are in that Big 12 championship game. Yeah, I definitely think they can do it too. 
All right, man. That being said, I guess that'll uh, that'll wrap us up on here. I appreciate you coming on, man, again, Stephen, and uh, hopefully get you on here again soon as the season goes on. Yeah, man, anytime. Absolutely. Let's go Mountaineers. Yeah, you're Mountaineers. Appreciate it. All right. Man. Take it easy, brother. All right. You too, bro. Bye. All right, we really appreciate Stephen Vestal for joining us yet again on the Country Roads webcast. He's a great guest and we always enjoy having him on. That being said, that'll pretty much wrap up this edition of the Country Roads webcast brought to you by Trio 4 Productions. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Cruz. Be on the lookout later in this week as we get set to bring you our preview of the Mountaineers' Big 12 opening game as they get ready to take on the Kansas State Wildcats at home in Morgantown. And that game will kick off at 3.30 and be televised nationally on ESPN. And you can uh, follow our Twitter page for updates leading up to that game and during that game. And you can find our Twitter page at WVU Country Roads on Twitter. And the Mountaineers will look to move to 3-0 and after that game and hopefully be 1-0 and in Big 12 play following that game. That being said, thanks for tuning in to the Country Roads webcast. And until next time, let's go Mountaineers. Are you ready to party? Country Roads.